Hi everyone. So my name is Anastasia Smirnova. I'm software developer at Vaudin. I've been working for three years before in support team and now I'm part of onboarding team. So I'm responsible for developer experience. I'm feeling a bit nervous to be honest. So please, if I will start talking too fast, let me know and I will slow down. Um, you've been very engaging audience and it's really great. I like your questions a lot. So yeah, let's do some. I hope you will learn something new today. So yeah, um, this is a brief outline of the session which we are going to have. We are going to basically we are going to talk about load testing in volume application. But first, let's start with talking talking about what performance it is itself. Then we will talk about um, volume internals. So basically, HTTP request and response, how it looks like, what does it contain, and moreover, why we actually talking differently, separately about volume. As a framework to load test, why we just not can why we just can't use the usual tools we have and live happily. Uh, yeah, one of the tools is Matter, and we are going a bit to talk about it. Uh, we are going to see some of its building blocks to load test volume applications, and if everything goes smoothly, we are going to have also a small demo. It's really a small demo, but let's hope it's going to work. So yeah, uh, I think no one doubts that. Testing is an inevitable part of software development cycle right now. Uh, there are different types of testing, starting from unit testing to acceptance testing at different granularity levels and everything. Uh, and performance testing as a testing, its main part is basically verifying non-functional requirements. So when we're talking about non-functional requirements, we are talking about reliability, uh, availability, and the requirements that customer has set for us are met. Um, yeah, I think no one doubt that uh, the, right now mostly people are trying to reach high availability. So the application is 99 and some C points available online. And to make it possible, we need to verify prior that it's actually doable. Yeah, but when we're talking about performance testing, we're talking about load testing, stress testing, scalability testing, spike testing, and a couple of, of other testing types as well, since performance testing is an umbrella term, and it concludes all of those. So now, as we do know what is performance testing, let's talk about why do, why do we actually interest in it. So what are the questions we are trying to answer? Uh, first of all, we are trying to figure out, can our system handle the growing base of users that we are going to have? And this is part of scalability testing. So can our system actually scale when we are going to have more users? And we are talking about stress testing when, when we are trying to figure out how our system is going to behave when we have too much users. So that's not unexpected, but what's going to happen? Will we get a normal? error notification of what is going to be with our system. Um, question which I usually impose in all types of testing, what is an acceptable response time? So, but to answer this, you have to know it beforehand. So in this phase, you have to verify it. You have to verify that the response time you are expecting is actually the one you, are, you have said before. So it's not like you're trying to figure out here what is it, it is. You want to verify it at this stage. Uh, and what about database? So it's a well-known fact that database is usually this one single point of failure, this bottleneck that we are trying to resolve. So do we actually get results in reasonable, in reasonable time when our user base is growing? And load testing, which we the main topic today, which we are going to talk about, is actually used to verify how does our system behave on low, average, and peak load. So here we are not trying to figure out what will happen if we have one billion users, which is hardly possible, basically, which is not possible. But what is our average and low load measurements should be? Yeah. So once again, anticipated realistic loads, load testing is focusing on it. Um, and yeah, that's the next point. How? Of course, we can we can create a room and we can ask our users just to sit there and handle everything manually, try to navigate to our page and try to see what happens. But it's, uh, it doesn't make much sense. It's very costly to make it manually and it doesn't produce all the results you want to figure out. So there are uh, there are tools 
like a fast meter, Gatling, smart meter loading, there's a lot, a lot of load testing has been available on the market. And the point they are working on, and I think load media is not working on a protocol level, but all the others are working on protocol levels. So basically, they they capture the HTTP request you are sending to your application and then replaying those with the amount of user specific with the amount of users you have specified. So in load testing, we are talking about here is load testing where users are simulated by some tool. In this case, we are going to talk about meter, but I will open a bit later while we are talking exactly about meter. Yeah. So now we are going to the most interesting part. Now we are going to the volume part. So why are we actually talking about volume separately? And that's because of it. Let's look at this HTTP request. You can notice that there are some different things which are not usually presented in other requests and responses. Yes, first of all, of course, Valid is a server-side application. So basically everything is started when user navigates to, to, to a web server via browser. So it's user centric. The user is the one who starts. And here, this is this is not first request we are sending. This is some random request during the communication. So here you can notice there are some volume specific things like say ref token, sync ID, client ID, and two and two more points here. You can notice here and here. But just look at it. Just look at this HTTP request and how it's different. Next, we have a response. This is a huge, this is also a random response from the app we are going to test a bit later. But what you should notice here is that it has this synchronization ID and client ID, the same values that it has have had in HTTP request previously. So basically in this response, you can see usually the response can be all these all three things and all the other will be empty. Uh, here response contains some update information to the UI. So those Cryptic values here, basically, this is an update information for you how to how to how to react to the change which is caused by our request. Yes, but let's see here. Here, those parts which have been noticed before are put separately. So this V R thing that we have noticed in the URL which we are sending to application and V. UI ID. Those are parts of the URL itself. So those are attributes in the URL. Uh, those are basically the ID of UI. You have a new UI when you have when you open a new tab. So for application to know when what UI has actually cost and even this is needed. And request type would be in it. It could be heartbeat. It could be push. And usually when they are sending a usual request, it the second type. Also, those synchronization tokens, which we have noticed in both requests and responses. This is tokens to verify that our communication is synchronization so that the message we are now receiving is the one we are supposed to answer. So if this is not the case, framework will throw an exception. So it will not proceed. Uh, this is server to client and client to server, both of those. And this cross-site request for jury token, this is token implemented by Varden inside, which is against cross-site request for Jira attack. Uh, usually other framework, server-side frameworks, for example, is Laravel, which is used in PHP, or if you're talking about Django for Python, they also have their own implementation of this set of token, but it's implemented differently. So you also have to take care about it, but in different way. Uh, here, for example, you see again those response and requests, so those, those are two random requests and response. I think next, yes. Uh, next here, I hope it will work as a shoot. It's a small video, uh, so, yeah, it's in a good quality. So here we are just navigating to an application and we, and we see what is happening behind. So this is the first request. And you should notice that in the first response, what is there are a huge amount of information in first response sent after we navigated. And one of those things is valid and security key, which is sent here. This is this cross-site request for token, which we are going to use next in every single request sent to server. So this token is exactly the same. Uh, I will notice after that um, a bit later that it can change, but basically you need to extract this token in order to make your load testing later workable. Yes, let's see. Uh, no, we have seen already that. Again, let's repeat it. 
to understand where what is actually going on. So we have a user and we have an application deployed to our web server. So first, user visits a page, let it be local host. We have this type of request. Uh, you can notice that here there is not yet any attributes added to URL, nothing. So this is first response. Server is sending back CCRF token, synchronization ID and client that is set both to zero. So this is information sent from server. Yeah, the answer is huge. For example, here I just took like wide security key, but there are a lot of other things. For example, push ID is also, yeah, you can notice it here. Push ID is also sent here. Uh, the application that I'm going to test is not going to be push enabled because push complicates things a lot. And if we are using push with web socket, we can't use such matter, but I will notice, uh, I will talk about it a bit later. Uh, so yes, after that, we have get the information. We're also getting, uh, ID of UI. So if you have only one tab open, you are, it's going to be zero. But of course, it depends if you have multiple multiple tabs open. And after that, it's going to be a normal communication where user is going to use CRF token and going to send synchronization ID and client ID, which it previously has received from server. So this is pretty much how it's going. This is reuse CRF token, and this is. For example, answer from a server when request has not caused any changes to UI. So if there, like, we did something, but, uh, but no changes to request to UI. What's the main point of Biden? So what is actually making it even more difficult when we're talking about load testing in a Biden application? It's not that difficult, but it's just something you have to be aware of. Everything in Biden is a component, everything. So in communication here, we are sending we identify identify an event with a component, with a particular component which have caused it. So, for example, here you can notice that when we click it, uh, okay, uh, there is no, it's not said what has happened here, but we can see that node which ID is five. It's actually not an ID, but it's not value which used as an entity as ID to identify on server side. The component is five. So those values are important to remember. Those values will stay the same. So once you have recorded your test, those values will stay the same. Is the hierarchy of your application will not change. Once you have changed the hierarchy of your application, those values will change. So basically it's good to extract those. But yes, I, I will make a small example of it. And now we've come to Jupyter. Finally. Uh, so basically what you should know about Jupyter, it's been around for around 20 years already, a bit more. Uh, it's open source, it's implemented in Java, and it's not a browser. It does not parse the JavaScript. That's the most important thing to remember here. It does not execute the JavaScript it received, and it does not render the HTML it has received. Uh, so how it works? Uh, of course, you can construct a test script by hand. You can configure every single request by hand and, and it will work. There is no problem there. But basically, it's easier to... Sorry if you have some sound. Maybe it's my... Sorry about it. I hope it's not that disturbing. Um, so here, of course, you can construct everything by hand, but it's better to let recorder record first all, all those events which you send to the browser. So for example, when you navigate, when you navigate to your, all right, I will show, it's better to show, but basically Gmeter Recorder works as a proxy. It inter intersects all the requests you're sending to web server and when web server answers to your browser, you're getting, it goes also to Gmeter, so Gmeter can capture those requests. Uh, yes, so this is what we're going to talk about and do today. So this recording template, uh, this is recording template which was done automatically by Jmeter. So you can choose just recording template. It has user defined variables, request defaults, cookie manager, and three, three group. Uh, of course, user defined variables, request defaults, and cookie manager are pretty obvious what does those mean. But three group is basically the heart of the test. Of the test, it contains the request which are going to be replayed when we simulate in users. Uh, so here is the test script recorder. Uh, sorry, maybe I should close comments because I'm 
paying attention to self, sorry about it. Uh, so basically the script recorder, this is how it looks like. Here, the most important thing you should notice should do you should click retrieve all embedded resources here this means that matter will not record the request to static resources like javascript files like image but it will fetch those with the request this is actually how browser works so when you're sending requests you are not sending to every single but browser will fetch those asynchronously so you're not doing like Synchronously 100 requests, your browser is fetching asynchronously static resources, and this makes matter behave the same way. Uh, yes, this is very important. Everything in VAD and Word when we are talking is, is an HTTP request. You might notice a small asterisk there. Exactly. That's when we are not talking about web sockets. When we are talking about web sockets, which is another protocol, this is not going to work. Uh, the problem with Jmeter is that it does not support web sockets. Uh, the tools I know about that do support is Nail Loader, I think. I have never tried it because it has a mm, subscription, but I have tried Gotlink and I know that in Gotlink it works. Uh, my colleague has created a web sockets recording. Recording in Gatling with WebSockets does not work easy, but it works so you can simulate Gatling in Gatling WebSockets. So remember if you need, if you have an application with enable push, which use WebSockets as a protocol, don't use Jmeter, you should go for something else. But if you have a normal application, you can start with Jmeter. But the most important here is that everything is HTTP request. And this is, for example, I was talking about three groups that it's part of every single test. So here you can notice it. Actually, test one can contain multiple thread groups and each thread group can represent its own base users. It can be users, normal users, it can be admin, so it depends on you. So now we are going to this part which we are talking about. So connection between VAR and, and Jmeter and cross-site request virtual talking. So what should we do about it? What, what's our point here? So we should extract it. Uh, we should retrieve an information from response to make our recorded script executable. So valid security key is a value which sent with the first response. Uh, here, valid security key is, which is the same as CSR token later on, use name. Uh, it's in UUEDL format, so you can use basically this one. Is this reg regex regular expression or you can use something simpler but for example here is this that's the one uh yes let's go to the small demo it's a really small demo uh, i have i have taken a starter application from our website it's running by the important version now it will start i am usually using firefox to record communication firefox has a good support for it but now starting like maybe it's happened during this year this happened now firefox does not listen for local hosts for proxy so you have to specify the full ip, IP address if you want to it's to be workable also we have i have already opened and created from file templates a recording template we have it here it's empty there is nothing here and there is this test script recorder so it's configured to listen to port 800. The same port is configured here. So they are listening to the same port. Now we can close this page. Uh, of course, this will, if we will now try to navigate, we are getting nothing because the proxy server is refusing the connection. But now we will start our test script recorder. It's complaining about self signed certificate, but it doesn't matter for us here. So what we are going to do? We are going to make a simple test. Uh, we have recording control here. Let's see. Also, just want to notice retrieve all embedded resources. We have checked it here. Anyway, let's go back. Let's assume we are navigating to the main page. It should work. I think our application running. Yes, our application running. Good. Let's put my name here. Let's say hello. You can notice a notification. So that's our test. We are not going to make it any harder. Now, as we have stopped proxy, 
the application stopped working. So we can notice that the test script recorder has close Firefox, we don't need it anymore. The recorder has noticed what we have sent and has taken it into account. We can see from here. So this was the basic the first request. This was the second request. And here we can notice that it's using, it uses already CCRF token and it uses sync ID and client ID. And that's something we want to change. We want those values not to be static. Those values are dynamic. And those all the other requests, uh, this is my name, which we are sending. This is a request for updating the notification. And this is actually open changed. Uh, this is notification open. So what will now we have a running application basically here. Let's see. Let's see why do we actually need to do anything with CCRF token. Let's try to replay our script, which we have done right now. So view results three. We are playing our script. And you can notice from here that server is refused to answer to our request invalid security key received from our host. So our script doesn't work. We are getting in response that is that query selector new, new resources up arrow. So it doesn't work right now. We want to fix it. To fix this, let's go to the first request. And we notice that in the first request, there is a huge response with all the information they need. So from this first response, we need to extract this value, varying, varying security key. I will, let's see how, so to do it, we are adding post processor, we are adding regular expression extractor. Name of created variable, let's call it as it was before. I will cheat and copy paste the value here, not to comment it. I'm also cheating and not using the correct pattern here, but I don't think it matters. I think it will forgive me, sorry. And we are specifying here that we want to extract on the, the first value. Uh, no need to define anything here. So this is a regular expression that will extract our security key. Great. So now we have extract security key and it will be available in, in matter session. So let's fix our, all our other requests. Now, as we have now this value, we can do it like this. We can reference the saved value as security key. Um, the bad thing is basically here is that you have to replace it everywhere. There is a utility in matter that you can choose everywhere and replace everywhere. So you don't need to make it by hand like this, but it's a bit cumbersome. So let's do it like this right now. It's a bit faster. Let's see if it works. Basically, right now, that's the only thing you have to do to rerun your test. Let's clear. So that's now destruction. And also, let's clear here. So let's if, see if something fails. And let's run it. So we have an error. Something did not work. The error most likely will be about unsupported exception. No. Exactly. So I have written somewhere something wrong. Let's see. So I have written it wrong right away here. Ah, actually we can change it, check it here, request, let's see. So it substituted it here correctly. Now, that's a, that's a problem I am missing. I'm missing this one. Sorry about it. But now you know that it will fail. Let's, let's do it again. So no errors in server console. You can see that it has substituted the value it's extracted from the first response. This is good. We also check in that response data does contain the valuable information here. Uh, we don't usually check by hand anything, so you would need to add assert points here. Those are added in post processors assert points. Good. But what's what's about synchronization tokens? Uh, let's do it also. The point with synchronization tokens is that you would need to extract it in every single request. So you would need to add 
to every single request zone. So it's, uh, but let's the regular expression inspector put, let's name it normally. So name of created variable. Um, what is happening here? We know that synchronization ID token is always an inter integer value. So anything from one to nine, as many characters as need to be, not greedy. And those braces means that, except, yes, of course, it's not going to work, sorry. This was so, but this was so optimistic. So like this now we can, now it knows what we should extract. See, good. I mean, so the same. Uh, of course, we can now put. All right, under this, nothing because it's the first one. The value which it will receive here is zero. But let's not put it here. Let's let's put it everywhere, and let's verify that it works. So how we are going to verify it? the same way as previously, and let's run and see if it works. All, all right, yes, yeah, yes. Let's put it also here, just for the sake of clarity. I'm not going to do it for everything because I think because I think we got the idea, but let's verify that what I actually shown is correct. Now that is not correct because because it didn't extract it. And why it didn't extract it? Let's, let's check. We are going here. We are going navigating to response key. We should, it should be here. So the was the name that I added was incorrect. Yes. And now it works. Now we can notice that it works. Uh, exactly the same you can do for client ID. So you are just copy pasting. It has exactly the same pattern. So like this. But I'm not going to do it to save time because we are going to run out of time. So this is how you're extracting tokens, like synchronization tokens and as synchronization tokens. You also can notice that right away we have a problem that when our synchronization doesn't work, so we are going to get an invalid feed role in our server socks. But that's all good and that's everything nice. But what we are going to take about this five, for example, here. So how should we extract it? And unfortunately, this is going to be a bit more complicated than I would like it to be, in a way that this first, so this five is a text field. I know it because it's here when we are putting Anastasia, we are referring to node number five. But node number five does not say us nothing. So how should we know that we need it? Let's see it here. Text field. So we have it here, text field, not five, not five text field, but that's a bit too cumbersome. Uh, basically here right now, of course, you could extract this value simply knowing that you have only one text field on the page, but this usually doesn't work. You usually have like hundreds of components and you might have 10 text fields, so this is not the correct way to find only one text field. And the problem in particular here, so that the first page we are getting, this is sent in this all huge response. And in this huge response, its information is structured a bit separately. Uh, it has some uh, spaces. So it took me a while when I tried to create a correct regular expression. Expression. I will just show it because. So usually when we are doing, we are, we are using usually regular expressions, and we, and we just specify node ID something 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 and feature. Now as I remember, sorry, I missed. So we are having this node ID five, and we are knowing that it's a text field, and we know that it has some capture, but we might have one hundred text fields. Of course, we first can find a capture, and we know that this cap sorry not capture caption, and we know that this caption belongs to this text field, and so on, and that they belong to one. But it's too complicated. It's really complicated. I've been extracting grids, and grids are complicated in this sense. So what we do, volume provides a method set ID. 
this method set an ID and identifier for a text field, and this edit percent once when component is first added to UI. So what we need to do, we need to find text field ID. And the node it has value. So here, this unfortunately it's not possible to make it very good in using regular expression. So we are going to use Ben shell here. It's not a complicated thing, but it, it just announced that you have to use different things. What we are doing here, we are using here regex patterns from Java language. So nothing very fancy. But so note. We are specifying that we are looking for a node value, which could be any integer, that it has type put, that its key is ID. This key is ID, that's exactly the text field ID. So this is the way how we are going to identify our element via its ID. Uh, so we are getting, what, what we are doing here, we are getting response, we are replacing all empty spaces here, all new lines. After that, we are getting one string which has nothing. From this string, we are getting, using regular extraction pattern and mature, we are getting our node value, which we would like. It's usually fine. Let's just copy paste this. Uh, usually, it's not that complicated. Usually, you can do the same way as regular extraction, just using the same pattern node type, put key, and extracting it. But here, it's a bit more complicated because it has additional spaces. So, unfortunately, we have to do it. And here, as you may notice, this is matter syntax. So we are putting here variable inside variables which are available to the whole session. Text field ID, and then this text field ID will be available. Uh, let's check it out. Let's replace here five. We can also replace it here five. And this can be also replaced. But let's see if it works. Request. Was it replaced? Yes, it was replaced. So this extraction has happened correctly. We have replaced, we have found the node ID value of text field we have based on the text field ID value we have set in our Java code. So again, we have set an ID to our text field value. Based on this ID value, we are extracting from a response, from the first response. Here, this is what we try. This is what we try to find. This one. So we have here node five type put key ID value text field ID. This is what we are trying to find node five. This is the only place where you could find what does node stand for. Here, the, the only place. I mean, the only the first time the component is added to UI. So it's here. Let's. Let's have a brief, brief recap of what you have done here. So you might ask, why do we actually do this? The only, as the only one requiring a CSA ref token, do we need to care about it, about everything else? Why do I need to care? Okay, okay. why do we need to care? From, of course, sorry, I'm interrupting myself. First of all, if you have 1,000 components, it's hardly possible that you're going to extract all the possible ID, IDs of all the possible ones. Don't do it. Extract only those which you are using in your own test. At least those. If you can do more, great, that's perfect. But extract at least those which you are using regularly. Because if your UI will change, you don't need to you don't you don't need to be uh, you don't need to be afraid that your test is going to fail. It will use it will fail for some things. It will just write you a message that hey, this is not found or this is missing. But your test logic will still work because you have extracted the IDs you are using and the values have changed dynamically as it should. About synchronization token and client ID, those usually they should have they should not change. Those should be the same. But sometimes when you're simulating like ten thousands of users. 100 users, you're going to get responses in different and you're going to get those values which something is answered prior to something else. Also, if you're using push, when you have an asynchronous communication, something is going to be answered prior to something. So it's a good practice to extract synchronization and identity. If you're testing 100 users, no problem, it should work. But if you're planning to test for more, to extract those. Uh, for example, if you would extract everything here, everything which you would, you would only have those channels empty. Uh, but 
all other dynamic values will be substituted and it's good. So as much as you can substitute, go for it. Uh, of course, another thing is that you could provide the dynamic values here using comma separated values. It's easy in matter, so just you will just add a comma separated value, but as it is a testing purpose, it doesn't matter here. You can put it also here, but those values can be also automated from dynamic values. But we are running out of time, so let's go back to our presentation. Um, let's now find our presentation. I have too much open. Sorry, let me let me see. Yes, come. Um, So again, about let, let, let's repeat what is actually important to remember here. Synchronization tokens are implemented by one, as we have seen in button communication cycle. You have got response, you are implemented synchronization ID value by one. The same goes for client ID value. Note value is described, of course, it's said every single time there is some of it, but note value is described only once when a component is attached to it. Yeah? So you need to extract it there at that point. CCRF token extracted in the first response and its value can be divided security and it's found by value security key. I noticed to you before that uh, there might be a, a couple of cross-site request for the token and that's the case if you have login enabled with your application. So because uh, you have one token before your user has logged in and you have another token after it has logged in. This is done for security measurement. So you will in if you're testing an application which has login, that's usually the case, you are going to extract this token two times, but it, it doesn't require much. You are just copy pasting the extractor you have had before. The same actually might apply to client ID and sync ID tokens, but yes, I think so. If you are if you are going another if you're having another page, you might need to do this as well. But otherwise Cross site request for your token should be extracted after loading. And uh, a short description of what are the common errors you might see when you load this in your modern application. Uh, for example, here you might see session expired through. This happens when you have an invalid CCRF token, invalid if you have an old one. So, not the one you just random taken, or the one you have used maybe a couple of hours before and your session has expired. So, you are going to get session expired message. And also, if you have an incorrect ID of your UI, so for example, when you have recorded your test scenario, you accidentally have opened a one UI prior. So in your recorded scenario, like here, you have UI ID set to one. And if when you are going to replay, most likely it's not going to work because you, you are simulating a new user and your user has a new UI and the ID of new UI is zero. So Pay attention to it. If you are going session expired and you are pretty sure that your CCRF token is correct, then check with this UI IDs. It's also very easy to miss, but script will not work. Uh, another thing is invalid synchronization client ID. Uh, the errors here is pretty obvious. You are getting that application error and sync ID minus one. Uh, not necessarily something else can also happen, but usually this is an indication that synchronization tokens are incorrect so the expected value is not the one you got. Uh, usually you're going to add, as I said earlier, you're going to add an assertion to your request. So you're not going to change it by hand. And as I noticed about node IDs, so about extracting only those nodes which are actually needed in the test. If you're going to make a request which contains some node ID which is not present anymore you're going to get the message you got an RPC for non-existent node. Your application will continue to work. That just means that the server does not know how to reply, which it just will return you an empty response or something. So nothing very bad here, but this basically means that you are making a request to a component which does not exist on the server side. For example, this might happen if you have an application with push logic enabled and you have notification popping up at a different time. And when you recorded your script, 
notification has appeared at this time, at this point. But when you're trying to replay, it looks differently because it has some asynchronous logic going on. And the ID a notification has a time of recording is not exactly the same. And that might be the error. That's not, it, it, it does not fail your test. Your application is going to work and your test will continue. But this is something to look for if you have extracted everything in you. Not sure what is going on. So, a short summary of how to load test the valid application. You should extract CCRF token. You should extract client and sync ID. Okay, you should extract client and synchronization ID, but you must ext extract the cross the CCRF token. Um, it's optional extract and replace node values of the VITSA element. And the most important, which is not related to value, but related to every single other load testing tool, you have to record a defined scenario. Don't record some random stuff. You, you have to define your scenario with stake, stakeholder and check only the things which are defined prior. Yes. Um, okay. So maybe maybe I should have checked it, said it also before, but I will notice it here. Of course, Vadin has provided a way to make load testing easier. You can disable CCRF protection. So disabling CCRF protection happens via disable CCRF protection, not annotation, but parameter. And the same, you can disable synchronization check. Uh, of course, but you should remember to enable it. Back. Usually, when I'm testing something, I'm simply extracting those because it's easier, because it reproduces the scenario better. But you can do it. You can create your own profile with those settings and everything will be there. Then you will need to extract all the nodes. Uh, I know that Smart Matter tool in Vardin 8, they have a feature, of course, Vardin 8 and Vardin 14 request, how they look like they have changed a lot. Uh, so I don't think this tool is working with Vardin 14 if it has not been ability, but it was able to do this work for you. So basically it has extracted also values uh, values of IDs and it has substituted those. So you have you received a completely working script that was modified for Vadin for some that a plugin for Vadin. But I don't think it works right now. But there are a lot of tools available in market for load testing and Jupyter just one of those. Yes. So thank you. I hope you have learned something new that was interesting. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure is there any questions? There is uh, one interesting question, um, if you want to answer that one. Let me check. Uh -huh. uh, you can configure running, uh, I'm not sure about Java class, but uh, you can configure run your matter test as a profile. I have done it, you can, um, I don't have this project right now open, but uh, there is um, there is a plugin for it. You can run, I mean, you can run Jmetter test during integration profile phase. Yes, you can. 